Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new around here, hi, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I talk about mostly true crime, but sometimes I err into just general mysteries as well, and I suppose today's case could very much be an amalgamation of the two. If you ask the authorities, for the most part they will say that today's case I'm going to share with you is not a crime, but it is a massive mystery, and so I can't wait to see what you guys think in the comments. Today I have just an absolutely wild story to share with you, the tale of how since August 2007 at least 20 detached human feet have been found on the coast of the Salish Sea, washing up on the shores of beaches in British Columbia, Canada and Washington in the USA. Is there a serial killer on the west coast of North America cutting people's feet off and throwing them into the sea? Is this maybe part of organised crime? Are all of these people victims of a boat or plane accident? Well, the accepted theory today is one that might surprise you, but you're going to have to stick around to hear what's probably really going on here. But first, I want to take a moment to talk to you about our sponsor today, Wild. Wild are on a mission to change the throwaway culture of everyday bathroom products, creating refillable products that actually work. I've been using Wild deodorant for a while now and it really is such a simple process. It comes in these reusable cases, mine is personalised and everything, with compostable refills. You just take the old one out and pop a new one in. And it's also made from natural ingredients, which is the key to staying fresh whilst also taking care of your health and the planet. The ingredients are classified as green in the EWG Skin Deep database, all refills are made in Europe, they're plant derived, vegan and cruelty free, and for those of you with more sensitive skin they also offer bicarbonate free deodorant refills. Is there any reason not to try it wild? I don't think so. And if you want to smell lovely and fresh just like me, my absolute favourite scent is the fresh cotton and sea salt, but the coconut and vanilla is a really close contender as well. You can check out all the ingredients yourself on Wild's website, I'll stick the link in the description box down below, along with my code GMWILD for 20% off, which will be auto applied at checkout if you fancy joining the Wild side. That is 20% off all products on your first subscription, including their refillable body wash, and the code doesn't last long, so make sure you check out ASAP. But let's get back to talking about feet. So our story begins all the way back in 2007 when on the 20th of August, a 12 year old girl visiting Jedediah Island in British Columbia is walking down the beach and she comes across what looks to be a black and white campus brand shoe. Out of curiosity, she picks it up and she notices a sock still inside. So as you do, she opens the sock and is presented with a decomposed human foot. Now obviously her and her family soon report this to the authorities who arrive at the scene. It was said that whilst this foot was obviously decomposing, there was still quite a big amount of human flesh on the bone. So investigators take on the case and they find out that it's a man's right foot. The shoes were size 12 white and blue mesh running shoes that were produced in 2003 and they were mainly distributed in India. Although there's very little information out there about each individual case here and the deceased about the people these feet belong to, the owner of this foot would much later be identified through DNA, found to be a man who had gone missing in this area in 2004. It was said that he suffered with very bad depression in life and it has been suggested that he chose to end his own life in the water. However, investigators didn't know this at the time the foot was found. All they had was a human foot and then just six days later, another male right foot was discovered, this time on Gabriola Island which is about 30 miles southeast of Jedediah where the first one had been found. I should probably actually share a bit about the geography here, I'm sure a lot of people won't be familiar with the Salish Sea, me included before diving into this research, excuse that accidental pun. So the Salish Sea is an inland sea that spans from the Campbell River in British Columbia, Canada to Olympia in Washington in the USA. The Canadian USA border runs through it, Vancouver and Seattle either side. The Salish Sea encompasses Puget Sound, the Strait of Georgia and the San Juan Islands. In total it has 419 islands on it, 7,470 kilometres of coastline and more than 8 million people living on the shores. 
This is also a great area of natural beauty and a hub for nature, with many endangered species naming this as their home. When I'm talking about feet turning up on the shore of the Salish Sea, I'm not talking about 20 feet appearing on one beach over the years. Seven and a half thousand kilometers of coastline is quite a vast space, and the feet turned up all over this. But obviously, single feet turning up on the shores was noticed quite quickly. The authorities paid attention both sides of the sea, so in the USA and Canada. The second foot on Gabriola Island was discovered by a couple who were hiking on the beach on August 26, 2007. Once again, it was a male right foot in a trainer or a sneaker. This time it was a size 12 white Reebok. Now this particular style of shoe was found to have been produced in 2004 and it was sold worldwide, but primarily in North America. And it seemed like the foot had been in the water quite a while and then it had been brought ashore by some kind of animal. Speaking about both feet which have been found at this point, Corporal Gary Cox of the Oceanside RCMP, which is the Canadian Police, said that they had been informed that they had been separated from the body by natural decomposition, most likely while in the water. Now obviously a clean cut foot to cut through the bone would have been very suspicious, a killer intentionally separating it from the body. But natural decomposition immediately suggested that the victims had drowned. Now that didn't make it not a homicide, but it was very clear that this wasn't somebody cutting up bodies and disposing of them in the water. This separation happened very naturally. The odds here though were, well, odd. In the space of just one week, two male right feet had washed up on Canadian shores, both wearing size 12 running shoes. Were they linked in any way? Was it pure coincidence? DNA analysis would later find that foot number two belonged to a male who went missing in 2006. Again, very limited or no information is available about the man in question. As I'm sure you can imagine, the RCMP were baffled by these feet, but then no more turned up until February 8th, 2008. The third was found on Valdez Island, an island immediately south of Gabriola Island, and once again it was a male right foot, although this time it was a size 11. The trainer this time was Nike, with investigation finding that this shoe had been sold across Canada and the USA in the first half of 2003. But once again, there were no signs that this foot had been severed from the body by tools or force. It just looked natural. I'm really sorry if you can hear purring in the mic, by the way. We've got co-host Rhubarb joining us today for this video. I've got an electric blanket on my lap keeping me warm and she also wants to be warm, so she's just curled up with me. Jumping ahead a bit in the timeline, in June 2008, another foot, which was foot number five, we found floating in the water off Westham Island by two hikers. Now, Westham is the other side of the coast of the Salish Sea. If Valdez is sort of on the west, Westham is directly opposite on the east. By mid-July 2008, authorities confirmed that feet number three and five belonged to the same man, left and right. They released photos of the shoes the feet were found in, hoping that somebody might recognise them, and they also announced that they were communicating with a forensic anthropologist, a forensic pathologist, oceanographers, and a forensic entomologist to assist with this investigation. At this point, they had started to attempt to match the feet with their owners using DNA. They had to go through a list of missing people and eliminate them one by one. It was a very time-consuming process. And remember, this was 2008. DNA testing was kind of still in its infancy at this time, so it wasn't really able to help determine much. You couldn't determine race, they couldn't tell the age of the victim, not that you ever can using DNA, but you really can't tell much about a person from a shoe and a decomposed foot. It was very much like looking for a needle in a haystack. At this time, they did have a working theory that the feet may have come from people involved in a plane crash in the Strait of Georgia near Quandra Island three years beforehand, which was a pretty solid theory for this time, I would say, but it would turn out to be incorrect. It wasn't until 2011 that they were finally able to identify the man to whom feet three and five belonged. I think most of the DNA matches up to this point were made in 2011. Once again, at the family's request of privacy, the identity of the man was held back, but it was released that he was a 21-year-old man from Surrey, which is a city southeast Vancouver, sitting on the Strait of Georgia. Foul play was ruled out, just as it was in each of the other feet that was discovered. 
A spokesperson for the RCMP said, all these individual deaths are well documented and there is enough evidence to suggest that these deaths were not suspicious, instead linking each one to misadventure and suicide. But now jumping back in the timeline a bit, foot number four that was found on May 22nd, 2008. It was a woman's right foot in a blue and white New Balance trainer found on Kirkland Island on the Fraser River, just south of Richmond. Analysis of the currents found that this foot had likely washed down the river from further inland rather than ever having been in the Salish Sea, which marked a huge difference from the other feet that had been found. And in 2011, this was confirmed when it was found that the fourth foot belonged to a woman who had jumped from a bridge in New Westminster in April 2004. Once again, this was not a suspicious death. Now, it's really odd that all of these people had gone missing around 2004 and only now in 2008, 2007, were their feet washing up. But we'll talk more about that later in the episode. By this point, everyone living in this area had become aware of the number of feet being found thanks to a lot of media coverage. And so it kind of became a case of everyone was out there looking for feet. So maybe it was just that a lot more were found. I'm sure there were a lot of shoes that would wash up on the shores. A lot would probably usually just be left alone or thrown back to sea without a second thought. People don't tend to make a habit of finding a shoe and then looking inside. But now people were looking inside the shoes that they found and they realized a lot of the time that feet remained inside. It kind of became a bit of a cycle, like people knew to look for the feet so more were being found and of course this also led the way for pranksters and copycats. After foot number five was found in the June, reports of number six came in that very same week but investigations soon found that it wasn't human at all. Somebody had thought it was a really great idea to shove an animal paw into a trainer and place it on the beach and this person took the time to ensure that it resembled human remains as close as possible. Like at this point you've got people all over this area just waiting for the next foot to be found. You've got families hoping that they might provide answers as to their missing loved ones. Finding out that people were making a mockery out of all this was a big blow to so many people and also it just wasted police time when they could have been actually doing something proper. The next legitimate foot wouldn't be found till the 1st of August 2008 by a camper on a beach. It was yet another right foot inside a man's black size 11 shoe encased in seaweed. This time it was in the Strait of Juan de Fuca around the border. It was about 50 kilometers west of Port Angeles in Washington. It was the first foot to be found outside of Canada, although it was agreed that the foot may have traveled from Canadian waters. This shoe was a black top athletic shoe. The foot inside was flesh and bone, but after being burned by the last discovery, the police made sure they did testing before being sure it was a human foot. And of course it was. The year before, a body was found in the San Juan Islands without feet, so they wanted to find out if these two were connected, but I couldn't find any further updates on this. I don't know if the feet did belong to this person. I'm sure it was reported out there somewhere, but it's actually really hard to find every single news article on a case online, especially one as large as this. And when so many of the articles are so old, you sort of find yourself trawling through old websites, going back to articles from 2008, you look at sort of like web archives, it just becomes this rabbit hole and you'll never find everything, especially when it's like this rogue thing that's reported once in an article in 2008. You try to follow threads, but sometimes they just lead to dead web pages and it just becomes this whole thing. In November 2008, they found another female foot floating in the Fraser River in Richmond, British Columbia. This one was wearing a New Balance running shoe and DNA analysis showed that it was a genetic match to foot number four that had been found six months earlier. That was the same person. And after that, things go quiet for about a year. The next foot isn't found for 11 months till October 27th, 2009. And this time it was another right foot in a size 8.5 Nike running shoe found on a beach in Richmond. The owner would later be identified as a man from Vancouver who had gone missing in January 2008. Foot number nine came on August 27th, 2010, and this one did mark a departure from the rest by just being a single right foot without a shoe or a sock. Whilst most of these bodies were found to have been in the water for many years, it was believed that this one had only been in the water for a couple of months. It was found on Whidbey Island in Washington. This foot was small and likely belonged to a woman or a child and it was announced at the time by the authorities that they didn't believe it was linked to the rest of the feet that had been found. 
DNA was tested, but there was no match at the time, and from what I can find, there remains to be no match. Another departure from the norm was foot number 10, found on the tidal flats in Tacoma, Washington. This was another small foot, thought to belong to a child or small adult, found inside a boy's size 6 Ozarks Trail brand hiking boot. This was the first shoe that was not a trainer, sneaker, running shoe, whatever you want to call it. I think whilst the first set of feet, maybe the first seven or eight, could all be considered linked in some way, after that point, any foot that was found in the Salish Sea was linked to the Salish Sea feet phenomenon. I don't really think the feet washing up on beaches is quite as unusual as you might expect, but at this point in time, all eyes were on it. All of these feet being found had to be linked, surely. In 2011, three more would be found. Number 11 was a foot found in a man's white and blue trainer, a size 9, found floating in the plaza of Nations Marina in False Creek, BC. This one actually still had the lower leg bones attached, detached from the body at the knee rather than at the ankle. But once again, it was a natural disarticulation. In November 2011, a man's right foot was found inside a size 12 hiking boot at Sassamat Lake in BC. Now this was found in a pool of fresh water, not actually in the sea, and it seems like this is one of the only feats we actually have a name for. In 2012, it was confirmed by the coroner that the foot was that of Stefan Zahorajuko, a local fisherman who had been missing since 1987. 24 years and his foot remained inside his boot for all those years. And then in December 2011, we had another departure from the norm when a human leg bone and foot were found inside a black plastic bag under the Ship Canal Bridge at Lake Union in Seattle. Obviously, this was not natural, feet aren't going to end up in a plastic bag in the sea by natural causes. However, as far as I can find, no identity has been found, nor has a cause of death. In 2012, only one foot was found in the January. The remains of what appeared to be a human foot was found in a boot in the sand along the waterline of a dog park in Vancouver. Around this point, the foot discoveries really slowed down. The next one wasn't found till May 2014. It was a foot in a New Balance shoe found along the shoreline of Centennial Park in Seattle. Now this style of shoe had become available for sale in April 2008. It was a 622 model with blue trim and size 10.5. In 2016, two feet were found in the space of a week near Port Renfrew on Vancouver Island and they both belonged to the same person. In 2017, the remains of a leg with a shoe attached washed up on the shore of Jordan River on Vancouver Island. In 2018, another one was found on Gabriola Island in BC, a human foot in a hiking boot. Another was found in September in West Vancouver. This foot was found in a Nike free running shoe on the shore of the beach. It was a size nine and a half, believed to be manufactured between February and April 2017. And this one is believed to have been a male under the age of 50. In 2019, the foot of 22-year-old Antonio Neal was found on Jetty Island in Washington. He disappeared 12 days before Christmas in 2016. He said goodbye to his mother and headed out with a friend, and then he just disappeared. There were no clues as to where he went until his foot was found in 2019. His mother immediately recognised the boot. It was faded from the salt water, and she recognised the sock as well, saying she watched him put on those socks every day. There was no visible trauma on the foot, but this discovery meant that Antonio was no longer a missing person. He was almost certainly dead. His death is classed as suspicious, but there isn't really enough to classify it as a homicide. There is a $1,000 reward for any tips in his case, so if anyone knows what happened to Antonio, his family are desperate for answers. I've actually added his case to my list of cases to cover. Maybe I'll talk about his case in full one day soon. To this very day, feet are still being found. In 2021, a size 7 Brahma work boot washed up on Locust Beach in Washington. There was a tube sock inside with the bones of a right foot belonging to a male. And then just five months ago, on July 23rd, 2023, a foot washed up on Gonzales Beach in Victoria, BC. But there are no publicly available details about that right now. The coroner's service are still investigating. So that's 23 feet found since 2007, all connected by the public to this same phenomenon, the Salish Sea feet. But do authorities actually think they're related? 
No, this list isn't an official list of interconnected cases. This is just a list of feet that have turned up in the same area over the last few years. As we've already covered, the vast majority of the identified victims here are confirmed to have ended their own lives in the water. There's no foul play involved. But it's still really weird, right? Like, why were there so many feet appearing, especially around 2007? Why did this only start in 2007? Before the victims started to be identified around 2011, there were lots of rumours that these may have been victims of the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. A theory which was kind of pushed for two main reasons. The first one was the fact that the shoe or foot number one was manufactured in India, so maybe they came from that area of the world. And then two is a pretty big one. So studies have shown that a human body in water will remain whole for about three years. The weight means they sink down to the depths. I mean, depending on currents, some fresh bodies will wash up on shore, but many do just sink. In 2016, a study was actually carried out using pig carcasses immersed in the Salish Sea to replicate a human body. According to an article in Vox, previous studies had said that a corpse could survive for weeks, months, years intact underwater. However, it was concluded here with this pig study that in the particularly well oxygenated parts of the Strait of Georgia, a body could be skeletonized in just four days. But that doesn't mean that the feet would separate from the body in that time, it just means the body would skeletonize. Of course, it does differ on a case by case basis, but lobsters, crabs, even fish will skeletonize a body over time, slowly eating away at the flesh. Most thin clothing will get eaten away and bones will be scattered across the ocean floor. But flesh and bones encased in shoes are protected from that nature. So eventually when the rest of the body has been eaten, they remain intact for the most part, safe and sound with the protection of socks and shoes. After a few years, thanks to the buoyancy of trainers, they float back up to the surface and end up washing to the shore in the windy conditions of this area. And a big part of this is actually thought to be down to the footwear industry in general. Trainers made post 2000s actually changed in design. They became lighter than ever with air pockets in the soles, meaning that they naturally float back up to the surface. Trainers made before the year 2000 just generally didn't have that. They were a lot heavier. Now, of course, there were a couple of anomalies within these feet with the hiking boots, but it could be that these hiking boots just held air pockets and they floated back up, or it could have just been a fluke. In general, hiking boots are a lot heavier though, less likely to float, which is why most of the time these feet were wearing trainers, sneakers, running shoes. I'm British, I say trainers. But coming back round to my original point of the tsunami, that happened three years before the feet started turning up in the Salish Sea. And sadly, 227,000 people died because of it. There would have been a lot of bodies lying on the floor of the Indian Ocean that were theorised could have eventually ended up being moved by currents to the Salish Sea and the feet washed up. However, this was ultimately debunked because of the flow of water into the Salish Sea. So the Salish Sea has multiple major waterways running into it from inland. The only proper waterway running out to the Pacific Ocean is the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And water doesn't run into the Salish Sea through this, but rather out to the Pacific. So it kind of wouldn't be possible for bodies in the Pacific Ocean to run into the Salish Sea. But of course, once identification started coming in around 2011, this was all confirmed. These weren't victims of the tsunami. But before that point, they already kind of knew it wasn't a possibility thanks to the way the water flows. Of course, there were also the obvious theories about a serial killer being responsible, perhaps one with a foot fetish, severing feet from the body and then disposing of them at a later date. But as we all know, it was established early on that these were natural disarticulations. So that was never really much of a strong theory in this case. But there was actually a lot of speculation surrounding Gary Ridgway in particular, who was convicted of 49 murders that he committed between the early 1980s and late 1990s. Being from this area around the Seattle area, he would dump many of his victims' bodies around Kings County, earning himself the moniker of the Green River Killer before he was captured. Maybe he was also disposing of bodies in the Green River, their feet eventually ending up at sea. But again, this theory was pretty quickly dismissed because Gary Ridgway targeted female sex workers and the vast majority of the feet found were male, so it was dismissed. Maybe he could have been responsible for the female feet that were found, but most of them have been identified. 
Authorities have always denied any link between these multiple cases here. It is just a case of multiple feet being found and what's identified, most have been found to have been cases of suicide. They say they don't have any answers as to why they only started to be discovered around 2007, but I do think it is most likely, as I mentioned earlier, this became a media phenomenon. People started to look out for the shoes instead of just ignoring gross shoes lying on the beach. Some of these cases could be connected, most of them are not. Some could be the result of homicide, most were not. It is just a fluke, it's just that more people were paying attention and looking inside the shoes they found. It does sound like something out of a horror movie, but there is a perfectly reasonable explanation. It's just kind of the human condition. I think this is a case which perfectly encapsulates Occam's razor, sometimes the most simple explanation is the correct one. But I would love to hear all of your thoughts and feelings about this case. What do you think happened? Do you think maybe there is something deeper going on here? Thank you so much for tuning in today. A huge thank you to Wild for sponsoring this video. Like I said earlier, links to their website and my code GMWILD will be linked in the description box for 20% off your first order. That's 20% off all their products. And I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.